Um, yeah, good afternoon, uh, or uh, good night, if I listen to my biological clock. Um, it's great to be back in, uh, in Sweden. Um, thanks, Olga, for, for the invitation. And um, yeah, I'm, it's thrilled to be back in Sweden. Um, I've been two years now in, uh, in Melbourne, at the University of Melbourne. Uh, but prior to that, I was at, uh, at Circle, um, at Lund University. Um, and doing a lot of work on uh, on innovation systems um, uh, and innovation policy, and it's also exciting to see how Vinova, in sort of in, a, in their journey, has adopted a sort of a challenge-driven, mission-oriented innovation policy paradigm. Um, I'm a bit um, fizzled of uh, presenting ahead of Dan when I told people in Melbourne that I was going to do a tag team with Dan, they said, oh, he's the best communicator I've ever heard. So I'm <laughs> really, really curious and uh, looking forward to, to his presentation. I'm really excited to show that. Oh, that's, that's reassuring. Yeah. Um, right. So um, while I was back in, uh, at, at Circle, we, we were already involved in the um, sort of uh, the discussions around the strategic innovation program. And uh, we've also sort of there set up a, a research network here in Sweden, uh, consisting of the University of Lund, Jönköping, Linköping, and there are some colleagues here in the room, um, Gothenburg, Chalmers, to, to do sort of um, action research on um, how is that sort of implementation of challenge-driven innovation policy in Sweden really, uh, really working out. Cool. Um, anyway, so uh, I left Sweden two years ago. Um, to start at the City of Melbourne uh, Chair of Resilient Cities. Um, it was quite a, a it's an interesting task because it's a sort of a first of its kind partnership between the University of Melbourne and uh, the City of Melbourne. Um, if we're talking about quadruple helix, um, often in Australia we are very much thinking about single helixes. There's still not really a tradition of um, sort of cross-sectoral collaboration. Um, but also to, for an innovation researcher to engage with the question of resilient cities. And I think that was really sort of interesting because as innovation researchers we tend to have a bit of a technological hang up. We are really interested in technological innovations, a lot of our theories are informed by technological change. But by engaging with something like how do you build resilient cities or how do you build uh, viable cities, you really have to engage also with other types of innovation, social innovation, as Olga was mentioning, grassroots innovation. I think in that sense it's also really enriching as a scholar to sort of you know, to engage with, with a somewhat different topic. So um, I'll tell you today a little bit about sort of our observations and impressions of uh, the implementation of the Resilient Melbourne strategy. Um, and what I'm going to try to do is to sort of show how that's sort of an expression of urban experimentation that seeks to sort of do mission-oriented innovation. And it also has a lot of sort of transformative potential in its strategy, in its sort of aims, in its rhetorics. But I will sort of try and uh, point out some of the heroic assumptions that are also underpinning it. And I'll try not to be too cynical or negative, uh, because I think you know, they're heroic because they, they are aspirational, uh, they're innovative but they're also really damn difficult. And um, even though we start to sort of get a handle around you know, how these sort of transformative innovation policy should work in theory, I think re the real sort of proof of eating the pudding comes when we sort of translate it into practice. And it's great to see that as an initiative like Viable Cities, that is having a time span of 10, 12 years. Um, my colleagues in Melbourne would probably be completely flabbergasted by that. Um, so. Where are we? Um, we are basically, a lot of people say we're witnessing a new dawn of a new sort of innovation policy paradigm. Um, but it's partly also a bit of a, a, a revisit of a mission-oriented perspective. We already had sort of mission-oriented innovation policy right after the Second World War, but primarily geared to technological missions. And um, that was partly actually reflected by, by Olga's uh, slide, where she sh sh showed the man on the moon. That was a classic sort of example of a traditional uh, mission-oriented innovation policy. But the mission was technological. It was not a societal mission. Uh, then we saw a sort of a turn um, towards innovation systems policy. And Vinova was very much sort of a pioneer in that as well, um, which took a broader understanding of innovation, 
which had more sort of actors and stakeholders involved in innovation, uh, but which was very much geared to sort of economic deliverables. Innovation for growth, for competitiveness, for productivity. So what we're now seeing is that that sort of narrow economic sort of rationale starts to open up a bit, and we're starting again to ask the question, so what do we actually do innovation for? If we have problems like climate change, maybe we should sort of indeed sort of change the directionality of innovation and really target those existential challenges. So, but these sort of new challenges are fundamentally different from the challenges or the missions that were set up in the, in the 50s, because these challenges are often characterized as wicked problems, right? These are problems that have different framings depending on who you ask. You know, what's sort of the root cause of climate change? How do we deal with its consequences? If you ta talk to different industries, if you talk to different citizens, they will give you different answers. So there's not a clear sort of you know, understanding of what the problem really is. And also, as we start addressing the problem, we're creating new problems. If we start to drive around all in electric vehicles, we'll have some issues with the, the resources that go into the, into the, the batteries. So these new missions are much more difficult to kind of get a, get a handle on. Um, and I think that's sort of the, the real sort of challenge for, for policy. How do we deal with mission-oriented uh, innovation policy, acknowledging that these are uh, wicked problems? So, a um, good colleague, Harald Rohracher, has already done a lot of work um, a couple of years ago about what's really this difference of uh, transformative innovation policy. And uh, sort of in a similar line as we often think about innovation policy as fixing problems or fixing failures, he identified uh, four sort of failures that policy needs to address um, to deal with sort of transformational innovation. The first, which we've already now discussed, is around directionality. Insufficiencies in setting priorities and guiding innovation towards important societal problems. But then secondly, also the demand articulation failure. Um, sort of the deficits, uh, the challenges of innovators to anticipate and learn about what our user needs. And here we have an understanding of users not just as consumers or as businesses, but users also as citizens, the civil society, or the public sector. So there's also sort of a broadening up of that notion of, of users. Then thirdly, uh, a, a, a challenge with regard to addressing policy coordination failures. If we th think about, for example, innovation policy for climate change, it's not anymore just about how do we facilitate innovation, how do we subsidize R&D, uh, how do we create networks, but also you know, policies around emissions, um, around public procurement, are really important um, policy instruments that, that, that feed, into, um, feed into this. Um, but often we see that typically these policies sort of split up across different silos and different departments uh, within government or also within different levels of, uh, of government. And then fourthly, and perhaps that's the thing that we also be a lot talking about today, is the reflexivity failure. And that really goes also to the notion of experimentation. That we really need to monitor um, the innovations that we are supporting. Uh, not just whether they are going to be or not technological successes, but really, as Olga already said, sort of what's, what's the process? How are users responding to these innovations? Just because they're possible doesn't mean that those innovations are necessarily desirable. We may wish that we've had avoided a lot of financial innovations that have come up and in that way may have prevented a global financial crisis. So again, it's also that sort of, you know, taking a step back and thinking about, oh, um, is that really, you know, how, how does that innovation sort of fit into the bigger scheme of things um, around societal challenges? So I think the literature then sort of agrees that to deal with these sort of more ambitious, more daunting um, sort of transformational challenges, um, the sort of the new way to look at innovation is through a lens of experimentation. And even some say that this is the way that we are now governing innovation. But even though there's really a mushrooming of, of papers and books now about experimentation, about urban living labs, it's also really still quite confusing because there are no sort of, you know, classic definitions or uh, sort of a more unified understanding of what we really mean by, in a, by experimentation. Some draw analogies to what's happening in laboratories. 
and about creating knowledge under uh, sort of uh, controlled circumstances. Um, others say it's about, well, how knowledge is really created in application and in practice and sort of tries to extend sort of the, the knowledge bases that are being considered for innovation beyond science, technology, but also the knowledge of citizens, the more sort of vernacular knowledge. Um, and some would say experimentation is about allowing for failure. It's about understanding that what you are trying to develop uh, might very well fail and sort of be a bit more relaxed and open-minded about that you know, possibility of failure. Now, that was uh, just a sort of frame where, where we're at with mission-oriented innovation policy. Um, let me now take you to Melbourne. Um, until very recently, the uh, world's second most livable city in the world, according to The Economist. And this year, this, um, this place was taken over by, by Vienna. Um, Still, it's a, it's, a, it's a very fascinating city. It's uh, deeply multicultural, uh, currently consists of 4.3 million inhabitants. Um, but what really sort of um, is happening there is that the predictions of that city towards 2050 is that it's going to grow to 8 million people. And that's going to create a lot of challenges when it comes to mobility because the current sort of urban system is all sort of geared towards car mobility. Uh, there are issues with an overheated housing market and housing affordability. Um, the city's urban, the city's uh, energy system is totally reliant on coal, uh, fossil fuels, um, and the city in, in Australia we are really already experiencing the impacts of accelerating climate change, with extreme heat events, um, with flash flooding, with bushfires at the sort of the, the edge of the city. So. The question is really about, you know, how can Melbourne not just be that livable city, but how can it also be um, a sustainable city? So another way to sort of look at these challenges is through the perspective of resilience. And I obviously need to sort of make that jump in order to sort of start talking about uh, a resilient Melbourne strategy. So resilience is all about being prepared against chronic stresses and acute shocks. And a lot of those sustainability challenges are translated also in shocks and stresses. Uh, notably, as I said, bushfires, uh, but also sort of the constant stress of being in a, a traffic uh, congestion uh, when you're driving around uh, Melbourne. So a couple of years ago, Melbourne therefore decided to um, apply for membership to the uh, 100 Resilient City Initiative that is pioneered by the Rockefeller uh, Foundation. Um, and basically, they sort of tried to, to also use that, um, that, that application to come to grips with, with a governance challenge in Melbourne. That metropolitan Melbourne consists of 32 local governments. So there's not one city of Melbourne. There is, but that's just a tiny sort of bit in the, in the center of the, of the metropolitan area. But there are 31 local councils around it, and they have very different political colors, different sort of challenges when it comes to resilience and sustainability. But there was really an ambition that if we're going to talk about a resilient Melbourne, we have to really think big and we have to think um, across the metropolitan scale. So the city used then um, the sort of application and the membership to the 100RC network to start drafting up uh, a strategy around how can we build a resilient Melbourne um, you know, for 2050. And uh, what then the 100RC network offers is funding um, for a chief resilience officer, which sort of sets up a office, a delivery office, that coordinates the development of a strategy and implementation of, of actions. And then also, uh, obviously, sort of access to best practice, sort of peer review from other member cities. So it's a classic example also of a city network, which I think has an interesting sort of analogy with uh, viable cities. But here we are talking about really a sort of a global uh, network of, of cities. Um, and then also through 100RC, uh, cities get access to so-called platform partners, Arab, for example, that Dan knows very well, uh, IBM, uh, but also smaller companies that provide sort of advice services to, uh, to the member cities. Now, um, as we speak, this is all very live and turbulent because until or exactly two weeks ago, um, the Rockefeller Foundation decided that it will terminate its 100 Resilient Cities initiative. So that doesn't mean that the cities will 
end, sort of working on resilience or that there's not anymore a network, but the Rockefeller Foundation decided that it's not going to fund that anymore. So it'll be really interesting to again talk in half a year to see what has been the impacts on cities about this decision by, by Rockefeller. Um, but yeah, that's, that's for another conversation. Um, so what Melbourne did um, when it sort of started with its resilient Melbourne sort of strategy development was first of all to do a wide consultation. 230 organizations were involved in various workshops and various you know, questionnaires, you name it, uh, about 1,000 individuals. And there they were actually sort of also thinking quadruple helix and very much actually focusing on how do we get citizens involved in this. Um, and that consultation process then led into sort of, you know, an identification of what are our key sort of challenges when it comes to building resilience, uh, what should we prioritize, what, where should we have sort of selectivity, and then sort of drafting projects that could start and sort of interrogate um, solutions to those resilience challenges. So very much sort of similar to Viable Cities, I guess, a big vision um, around a Melbourne that's viable, sustainable, livable, and prosperous today and in the future. Um, a strong focus on communities to get that sort of demand articulation um, uh, going. Um, then also an emphasis actually on, on policy coordination, um, partnerships across communities, academia, business, different levels of government and that reflexivity, sort of acknowledging that we'll do 32 projects, 32 demonstration projects. They're going to test and trial solutions to build urban resilience. So in that sense, um, this initiative very much fits the bill uh, in, in our understanding of urban experimentation as purposive interventions with a more or less explicit attempt to innovate, learn, or gain experience. And to just give you an example of how those actions could look like, one is, for example, the Metropolitan Urban Forest Strategy, which seeks to extend and link existing urban greening, uh, reforestation, uh, nature initiatives across Melbourne, across metropolitan Melbourne, to improve biodiversity, health, well-being, and reduce our exposure to hazards such as weed waves and, and flooding. Another uh, sort of flagship project is the Metropolitan Cycling Network which is trying to pool knowledge from research, government, infrastructure agencies, uh, cycling advocacy groups, and to basically come up with a plan to develop a metropolitan bicycle path network and to advocate and to get, get more Melburnians um, on, on the bike, basically. Now, um, now the cynic in me um, will appear, um, because on paper, this strategy looks really terrific. Um, and there's a lot of really great ambitions and intentions about trialing innovative solutions to build resilience. But at the same time, while it's being implemented, we also experience this sort of innovation paradox. Yes, everybody wants innovation, but no, 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 we don't want change. And that could be change, you know, for households. They don't want to sort of, you know, leave behind their car and jump on a bike but also for governments, uh, government agencies to suddenly ch change their practices, start working more with civil society or more with the private sector. So this is sort of the, um, the, the struggle that, that the implementation of the strategy is really facing. So just then to start wrapping things up, um, what are then some of the heroic assumptions um, that underpin the strategy and that really become obvious when uh, the implementation of the strategy is happening. And again, let me stress that I think, you know, there's a sort of a, a, an ambivalence in, in, hero, in, hero, in what I want to point out with heroic. These are very aspirational, it's a very aspirational strategy and aspirational projects, um, but at the same time, um, you know, they, they're maybe not really fully matured and haven't really sort of yet uh, stood the test of practice. So to run through a, past, a few, and I hope that this could be some inspiration then for the later uh, afternoon session where we're going to think about how we can design experiments to address you know, missions of climate neutral cities. So as Al Gold already mentioned, a big emphasis on co-creation with sort of partners across different sectors in society, notably the civil, uh, civil, uh, uh, civil society sector. And indeed, as we see, that is really a challenge to get them on board. So there's really also politics at play here about who is invited to join a co-creation session 
who is invited to co-create the Resilient Melbourne strategy? Are there some voices that are more important, that are more influential, but are also more knowledgeable about what those challenges could be? Um, and once you sort of get through the co-creation process, you also start to experience a, a risk for pilotitis um, or a consultation and workshop fatigue. So, I mean, a lot of the, again, the, implement, the, the projects really happen in places like this, in meeting rooms, doing workshops, um, but what is really happening in practice? Um, what is happening really on the ground? Um, how is the co-creation happening there? These are some of the more tougher questions, I think, that we're, we're grappling with here. Similarly, with regard to the sort of, you know, the, the emphasis on iterative trial and error. Again, um, if you know the innovation sort of uh, literature well, uh, you know, it's not a surprise that nine out of ten innovation projects fail. So that's the theory. But then, how does that translate into practice? So we think, you know, it's important with learning and we learn a lot from mistakes. When we start running projects with local governments, they have quite strict sort of accountability logics about are we actually making an investment that provides a return on investment to our citizens, to our taxpayers? And the Resilient Melbourne office is really a struggle to sort of keep, for example, those 32 local governments on board every year, negotiate a budget, negotiate their support, because they are constantly asking them, hey, am I really spending my, 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 my taxpayers' money well? Um, so that's sort of something that you know, you may sort of overlook when the emphasis is on learning and on trial and error. But we also need to think about, you know, how do we measure for accountability? And also then that, um, which is related to this, and which Olga also already pointed out, sort of the difficulty of, um, or the, the tension between project logics with sort of relatively short-term, short, -term, short uh, lifespans, short-term uh, deliverables, tangible deliverables, and then rather uh, long-term and quite ambitious sort of objectives about you know, making entirely Melbourne more resilient. How does that sort of, you know, relate to each other? Um, and you see that a lot of projects actually start to um, become primarily interested in surviving for their own sake. Partners have invested in, um, you know, an R&D uh, uh, investment, and, and they want to make sure that that project just, you know, pays off. Then, uh, with regard to policy coordination and learning, um, again, um, we know from theory that it's important, but in practice, a lot of politicians uh, and policymakers may not be that interested in actually learning. It's way too vague, it's way too fuzzy. Um, again, how do I account for that? So, Again, that's a sort of a reality to, to, to take into account that, you know, um, politicians will want to know um, what can I show my citizens? Um, you know, where can I cut a ribbon? Uh, can I announce a flashy announcement uh, of a new infrastructure or a new building and so on, a new swimming pool? Then um, the vexing challenge of scaling up. Um, a lot of, at least in Melbourne, a lot of the projects were really just set up as a project, without really thinking about, so what happens next? And also, to my quite surprise, um, the implementation of the strategy was not really resourced from the beginning. So they, they endorsed the strategy, but then the different projects had to go running after resources to actually make it happen. I think that is different here in, with Viable Cities, thank God. But still, um, it's important to think also when you start designing projects, so, you know, what's going to, to happen in the afterlife of the project? Can we already think about mechanisms, about ways that, you know, we, in the course of the project, think about scalability, about making an impact uh, at other, you know, levels of government, of, you know, diffusion of knowledge to, you know, ac across industry and so on. And then finally, what was also quite uh, interesting to observe is that even though the discourse is about, you know, we're trying new approaches and some talk about, yes, we need new ways of governing our uh, urban energy systems and we need new ways of governing um, housing, um, still a lot of the projects were really about technical solutions and technical showcases. Very much, again, about showing you know, how 
interesting, good, successful uh, this project is, and not really sort of uh, engaging with a more messy um, concept of, of you know governance experimentation. And then finally, and that sort of is perhaps partly now confirmed with the decision of, of the Rockefeller Foundation, um, this sort of 100 Resilient Cities Network has also quite weak organizational capacity to orchestrate and monitor uh, experiments. So when I started the position, I immediately asked, so what are you doing in terms of you know, monitoring and evaluation, what's happening in these cities? And the question I got back was, yeah, tell me. So uh, this is kind of, I think, interesting if you compare that, for example, with a lot of the innovation sort of policies and programs that are being supported at the EU level, where they very much want to um, support a monitoring uh, infrastructure and same for for Vinova. You won't get uh, support for an innovation project if you don't have a project um, logic. But with Resilient Melbourne and 100 RC, um, that was need not really on the table. Um, now, in hindsight, I found out that they are monitoring obviously what is happening in the different cities, but a lot of the knowledge and intelligence um, is kept within the headquarters of 100 RC. And it'll be an interesting discussion now when uh, Rockefeller sort of pulls out what is going to happen with that knowledge. And some of my colleagues already say, oh, listen, they're just going to commercialize it. They're just going to sell it to the highest bidder uh, rather than making it publicly available. So in that sense, again, um, it's great to see that here in Sweden, you know, you would engage much more with academics and providing sort of a, a public knowledge base around what can we learn from experiments. Um, but again, that is not something that is taken for granted, and we see with, you know, global city networks like 100RC or C40 that you know there's there's much more sort of a, a private pr perspective on it. So I'll leave it at that. I hope that sort of provides some food for thoughts and some reflections for how we can do experimentation, and I very much look forward to the presentation of Dan. Thank you. <laughs>